This is the Gig Ready Podcast. Hey, hey, everybody. Jordan Goodfellow here with Gig Ready, and we have an exciting afternoon for you today. We have the one and only John Featherstone. (laughs) Principal and Chief Lighting Designer at Light Switch Design. Uh, one of my all-time favorite people, good friend, colleague, uh, fellow business owner. And uh, I love working with him every show we do together. So let's welcome John. John, how are you today, sir? I'm doing, as I say, often at the moment, as well as can be expected, Jordan. I hope you and everybody that's listening is, is the same. These are difficult and challenging times, but um, the expression, I believe, is that which does not kill us makes us stronger. So we're going to emerge from this a stronger and better business of this I have no doubt. A hundred percent. I think everybody will re- emerge stronger. I'm excited, actually, for what is going to come of this. Um, you know, I think that this is going to be that moment where everybody has to dig a little deeper, think a little bit yeah. Yeah. more different than the way that we've been doing it. Um you know, for the last 10 years or so. And uh, I think there will be a lot of opportunity coming out of this that we don't even see yet. So, you know. Yeah, Will Will Smith, the actor, has has a great quote. He says, God puts everything worthwhile on the other side of fear. So I think that's a really good way to think about this, that everything that involves growth and development and strength, both personally and professionally, always comes on the other side of adversity. So 100%. that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to look forward with bright eyes towards a great future and try not to look back at what we've gone through or even what we're going through, but just continue to, to manifest a more, a, a, more, a more positive tomorrow. That's right. And ultimately, that's our goal here at Gig Ready is to help everybody listening be more ready for their next gig once they're done listening than they are right now so that we are right. um, better and stronger as we go forward. So hey, let's um, talk about gigs as we can't do gigs. Let's at least yeah, talk about them. Exactly. And yeah. uh, it's the thing we don't ever get to do at gigs is spend exactly. time talking about yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, to start it off, ultimately, um, you know, you lighting designer, uh, designer in general experiences, storytelling. Um, when you walk into an event, what do you see your role as a designer, whether it's virtual, whether it's hybrid, whether it's live in person experience? Um, how do you, how do you approach that mentally and, and look at that as a designer? Yeah, that's a great question, Jordan. I, I, I think for, for us, and it's one of the reasons why I enjoy working with you because I think you embrace this as well. Um, it, it's, it's all about the story, you know, and, and it's easy for those of us that are gear junkies and you're a fellow gear junkie as well <laughs> to get pulled into the, hey, look at this cool thing, look at this new way, look at this technique. But, but what we like to do is always pull it back to the story and, and really understand our clients and what story they're trying to tell, whether it's a spaceship company or a hotel or a theme park or a corporate client or a concert performer what we view our job is is to help them tell their story and in order to do that with accuracy and and efficiency efficiency from every aspect whether it's financial or pragmatic we need to really understand that story now sometimes um we work with clients who are super clear on what their story is and really really know it i I still have it when we we started to work with um uh, the band imagine dragons where before they'd even done their first club tour uh, and and when I was talking to them and we were working with my dear friend and collaborator, Nook Schoenfeld, uh, I, I said to them, I said, what do you guys want? What do you want your show? And and um, and Dan, the singer said, um, oh, I've got something I'll send you. And it was literally every song, what the song was about, the moods, where he wanted to take the audience to, the set list. He, he mapped out everything. And, and interestingly, Dan, before he um, uh, took the path of being a singer, being in Imagine Dragons, was enrolled to be to go to the FBI Academy. So he's super analytical. There are other people who are less clear about that, Jordan. Um, and, and one of the things that that I view as my my job is to try and help people be comfortable talking about their story. Um, sure. It's super easy to talk about brands and colors and logos and palettes and that stuff. But what we try to do is always come back to how do you want to make people feel. I think the thing we're all missing at the moment is the emotional response of a, of, a, of a shared life experience, whether it's a concert 
or a great business meeting or seeing friends and exciting staff at an industry um, uh, event like, like uh, LDI, there's that physical, visceral experience. Uh, and yeah. so we, we try to get people comfortable talking in abstract languages. So we use things like one of my favorite questions is, and there's a lot of hypotheticals with this now, but, but um, you're on the plane, you're flying home, there's two people in the row behind you talking about your event. What do you want them to be saying? What are the things that you want them to carry away? We talk at Lightswitch a lot about this notion of an emotional souvenir, which means that we want to work with our clients to give people a specific thing that they take away. And the clearer we can be about defining what that emotional souvenir is, the better we're gonna be at delivering it. And, and frankly, if from a client standpoint, if they don't understand what they want their audience to have as an emotional souvenir, they're not ready to do an event. Um, uh, Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain something in two sentences, then you don't understand it well enough. Um, and, and I think helping our clients do that, and, and again, it's one of the reasons why, why I think you and I make, make good uh, colleagues is we're constantly asking, yeah, that's great, why are we doing it? You know, the, the Jeff Goldblum character in, um, in Jurassic Park had a, had a line I love where he said, uh, you guys spent so long trying to figure out whether you could, you never even thought about whether you should. And, and I think we see a lot of that in our business where you go, that's really great. Why are you doing that? So. <laughs> oh man. I, yes, I totally get that. Um, it certainly is, is interesting as we walk through helping people understand and learn, like, what are you actually trying to do? I get right, how you have right. this massive screen here, but you know, we didn't create any content for it. So help me understand what direction we're trying to go here. Right, right. And, and I think staying clear on the, um, the, the, those that know me, have heard me bang on about this a bunch of times before, that, that when people ask me how many shows I'm doing, uh, like, like you in, in, in times other than, than uh, in the middle of a global pandemic, we have a lot of projects on the go. Um, so people ask me how many shows I'm doing and I'm saying I'm always doing at least four. And I don't mean that I'm doing four different shows. I mean, I'm doing the same show through four different methods. And what I mean by that is there's the show I'm doing for myself because I'm a creative person. And as a creative person, I have an ego. And there are things that I wanna do because I wanna do them because they, I think they're right. Um, and the second show I'm doing is the show I'm doing with my colleagues, people like you and uh, Kelly Epperson, who you had on recently, who I love to collaborate with. And, video designers and video directors and, and, and technical staff. The third show is the show that we as a group do for our appearance client, the producer and the client and the, and the end clients. What do they want to deliver? What's the story they, they want to tell? But the most important one is the show that we do for really all of our clients, which is the audience. Um, and that's making sure that we don't let the production tale wag the dog of the audience experience. Th little things, things like um, everything from asking people at front of house to keep their monitors as low as possible so the audience behind can see over them, to I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for watching your rehearsals from as many places as you possibly can, because there's only one person sitting where you're sitting and that's you to have an experience mm. about where other people are sitting. And I've seen you do this a lot, Jordan, is get up into the balconies, see where other people are seeing, have a look at what other perspectives on, on the experience is, and, the, and um, make sure you're not shining a light in somebody's eyes the whole time. If you've got a row of Sharpies that are doing this for the whole evening, make sure that that's not in the eyes of somebody that spent 150 bucks for that ticket and all they see is your light. <laughs> Try and think through the eyes of your audience. And, and, and I think that's, that's that that will help you define a lot of the inter ways you interface and intersect with other yeah. people. Great. That's fantastic. That's a great description. Um, I love the four, the four shows all wrapped up into one. And, and right. that, that is something that I need to remember more often. How often do I get caught in my own, like the one show that's for me, forgetting right. what's going on around me. So, and, and both ways, Jordan, because I'm sure you, you like I, you, 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 your, your give a shit meter pegs really high. So I know you're like me. You've got, because you and I've talked about this, you've got to the end of the projects and, you know, and you're kind of, for one reason or another, it didn't go super well from your perspective and you're kind of head hung low. And then you run into the client, and the client's like, 
oh my God, that was amazing. That was everything I could have hoped for and more. 50 people have talked to me already about it. And, and so it's finding the balance point between those because yeah. occasionally we'll do shows that, that where you peg at 100% on all of those, but there, there's always the ebb and flow. And I think playing the average of those four is a great way for those of us that are, that are passionate creatives and also people that try to espouse the notion of being a pragmatic visionary, that it's all about finding the balance between those different aspects of, of life event production. Yeah. No, it's a tough balance to find. And that, of course, speaks to the project itself, um, you know, and how we take a project from start to finish. You know, there's this huge space in the middle, um, you know, at Light Switch. What do you guys do or you personally do to manage that process in between? Like, what are the steps you look at, you know, A, B, C, if, if you look at it that way or however you see that? What are okay. kind of the steps you take through that process from beginning to end? Um, obviously, we, we, are, we are all over the map in terms of the kinds of projects we're doing, everything from live events to architectural projects to themed environments to urban space making. So, so there, there aren't a lot of commonalities with, with the actual tactical execution, but I think there are some hallmarks of the way we try to work. Um, we, we are, at, at our heart, a collaborative team-based organization. That's why we're called Light Switch, not let me get this right, Featherstone, Schwab, Warner, Medvitz, Malchus, uh, Elick, you know, we, which would sound <laughs> like the world's worst law practice because we want to be a collaborative and collective. So we're all about sharing ideas internally, putting as many smart minds. And, and, and frankly, that applies to the whole group. There, there's, there's no such thing as a bad source for a good idea. Um, and then we try to think of information. You know, there, there's, I believe there's a bipolar opinion about information. There are people that think information is power, and then there are people that think information is empowerment. Um, hmm. And 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 I'm and light switch in general, we trend we trend to the latter, that we want to share information with people as efficiently as and effectively as possible. One of the things that I say all the time when we have people start with us and they're starting in the process, often in the paperwork and drafting end of things is. The goal with a lighting plot or a set of lighting documentation is zero questions. That if you're creating a document that you hand to the production electrician, to the technical director, to the rigger, to your colleagues in other departments, and you get crickets, that's, that's a win. Um, I know in theater, there's a, there's a different protocol that sometimes in theater design, the, the information is a little bit more paid out on a rope. We try yeah. to put as much useful information as we can on a drawing. Now, that then becomes this is a whole this is probably a whole nother podcast talking about drawings and documentation because you can <laughs> go too far and people are weeding through all this minutiae and obfuscation to find the information they need, but delivering the information people want in a way that is clear and understandable and concise. Little things for us on our drawings, the symbol of the light looks like what the light actually is, and for our team, they can look at it and go, "Oh, that's a mega pointy." That's a Mac Viper, that's a BMFL, because it looks like it. Um, we're big on using color in drawings and documentation. We're lighting designers, we like, we like playing with the crayons. Of course. Um, so I think that process, Jordan, is, 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 is a commonality. The other thing that we try to do is make sure that we think about stuff as much as we possibly can ahead of time that it's not throw a bunch of lights on a plot and get on site. And if you've got to move a bunch of them, it doesn't matter. It does. It's our client's money. We yeah. want the money to be spent where the audience see it. Not necessarily in lighting, preferably in lighting, but also in video and audio and scenic. But we want every dollar to go where it has a demonstrable effect. So yeah. designing systems that go in really efficiently and, and are at or below budget is, is important. But also being really clear ourselves What's important? You, you and I have had several of these discussions with varying degrees of, shall we say, passion about it, because there's a lot of stuff where we'll go, yeah, of course you can move that. If you need to hang a speaker there, move that over a little bit. The rigging point didn't land where it's supposed to, doesn't matter. But in order, I think, to have professional credibility, you need to be prepared to understand what you can let go. And then you mm -hmm. need to have other people, your colleagues understand that when you go, no, I'm really sorry. That actually has to be there. But you mean it and you don't pay that card all the time. You know, Kelly yeah. and I, obviously, working with 
you know, Stan Dickerson and, you know, Carmen Educate and all these great audio designers that we, you know, just to name three that we get to work with, there's an ebb and flow. We'll start with a million cubic feet arena and we all want to be in the same six square feet area. So there's inevitably these kind of like, you know, it's a little like playing the production version of Risk, who can annex that part of territory first. But but there needs to be an ebb and flow with that. And 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 the people that I that I just named, and there's a bunch more as well, are enjoyable to work with because they're pragmatic as well as visionary. Yeah. And when Stan says to me, or Carmen says to me, or Kelly says to me, I, I really need I need this. I'm sorry, I need a solid here. You know, the 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 project we worked together on for 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 New Skin, where we had you know Stan working on the audio design for the for the meeting side of it and Carmen working with uh, Colin Pink from Hans Zimmer's organization. I can't remember his name, who mixed um, uh, uh, the Christina Aguilera uh, portion. There was a, a number of different disciplines there and, and, and constituent parties that needed to align. So when Carmen said, this is where I need the line array because this is what's going to make Colin happy. And yes, the Hans Zimmer show is going to look amazing. But to use a cliche, nobody goes home humming the lights. Then, I, then I understand that I have to that I have to let that that go and yeah. be flexible and nimble. But when I say no, this is where I really need to put this trust because it's a spot position, and that's kind of what I need for video. Then they know that I play that card only when I kind of really need to as well. Yeah, hundred percent. In fact, there have been times I've come to you and said, John, I hate to ask this question, but we need right. to consider moving. And before I even get it out of my mouth, you're like. Ah, that's fine. Don't worry. Right. About it. okay. well, it'll be okay. Well, yeah. you know, oh, my favorite line. If you hadn't told me, I probably wouldn't have noticed. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So through that process, you know, concept, put it on paper, take the paper, communicate with everybody on what needs to go where, where we place it. What else do you guys use to stay organized? Of course, vector works. I mean, that is like the standard for all of us plots and sheets and everything else. What are, is there anything else you guys are using as a as a design firm to stay organized? Yeah, we 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 we're very lucky to have um, Mike Robertson. You you know Mike well who, as one of our team who who is the king of previs for us, and, and and we were very early adopters of pre visualization technology. Um, and, for, and for those from other disciplines that may not be uh, familiar with it, it really started with a piece of software from a Canadian company uh, that was called WYSIWYG, which was an acronym for what you see is what you get. And, and it's, it's basically lighting design meets video games. Uh, and it lets us produce not even the kind of 3D that you get from Vectorworks, which is great. And certainly with Spotlight, it's great, but a real pragmatic way to pre-program shows. Yeah. So we use that a lot as a validator and, and we encourage other departments to work with it. Some of the video directors we work with, Randy Young's a great example. Um, Randy will embrace the ability to double check where his cameras are, to validate what is happening for him in a real 3D space. <laughs> So what it lets us do is map not only the fixtures and their and their positions, but the beam characteristics, the shape. You know, a lot of what we do, or certainly a lot of the way I work, is is basically drawing shapes in the air using lighting, certainly for mm -hmm. entertainment stuff. So to be able to look at what those those um, aspects of the design look like, as well as a real world, yeah, okay, I I know Spotlight says the beam characteristic is this, but but. I know that in MA3D, it will do things like illuminate the PA that it's close to so I can make sure that the fixture is not only missing it from a true optical standpoint, but is not, for example, highlighting the PA. So, yeah. so we try to get um, out of Vectorworks and into, we sort of have a, a fork in the road where we reach a point where, where Vectorworks becomes a tool for, you know, Lacey Taylor and Steve Hibben and, and, Chris Strasberg and all the great production electricians we work with that becomes their pragmatic guide touchstone. And, mm -hmm. and from the creative side, DC and Mike and, and, and uh, Chris Herman and, and Merriman and all the programmers we work with start to move into a um, 3D world, predominantly with MA3D, but also with the um, visualization software that Disguise do as part of their offering so that we can start to... Um, to work really on the show from a pragmatic standpoint yeah. and from queuing and focusing and palettes and groups and all of that kind of housekeeping, 
none of which you get in Vectorworks. You can do a beautiful rendering in Vectorworks, but that doesn't actually move the needle in terms of the, sh the process of the show. So, 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 sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, so are you, are you moving into previs like weeks before we even get on site to previs? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and and and, okay. and a lot of that, a lot of that isn't so much about um, writing cues, but doing the kind of pragmatic things that we were talking about. And and it, obviously, you can go into spotlight and you can grab where the light is pointing. You can wing it around. But DC sitting at home with his um, on PC or or, or uh, even working with the with the the handles within. Um, within MA3D and you know other visualizers are available um, to move the light around, to be able to grab blocks of lights. And, and, and frankly, with, with a moving light system, it, it used to be, gosh, I remember Jordan, I'm gonna date myself here, where if you had, uh, you know, I took, I took Duran Duran out doing arenas and we had 48 Vera lights and it was a lot. I remember the first, the, the first tour that I did that I had a hundred Vera lights and you went beyond the first page of the century panel. I don't know if you remember that from the Verilite desk where you had one through 100. And then you that's how you would select lights was it was a 10 by 10 matrix. The first time we did a tour that got onto the second page of that, we were like, oh man, you know, this is insane. But now, I mean, you know, New Skin, D DC and Mike between them, you know, Mike was programming winches on New Skin, DC was programming the lighting for the entertainment stuff. Chris Herman was doing the lighting for the business meeting stuff. There was, seven or 800 moving lights on that project. There is a ton of data management before you can even write the first queue. So yeah. the programmer needs to write all of their groups, all of their palettes, all of the focuses, make sure that simple things that happen, like when you turn the wheel this way on the board, all the lights move the same direction. There's a, there's a lot of that housekeeping. So we, we move into previous as rapidly as we can to validate all of that. And, and yeah. frankly, because this goes to what we were saying before about not wanting to do stuff twice, is if we can be in the 3D model and go, hey, Lacey, actually, can you take that light and move it two sticks of hub truss down to the right? Because it's not actually hitting the PA, but it's certainly lighting the PA or spilling on the video screen or lighting the set piece or whatever. It's that, you know, that's, that's a really useful yeah. tool for us. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't realize you guys moved into the the 3d space so quickly um it yeah might... and, and, and yeah yeah and a lot of the time when you see us we we sit down and we're like all right q, q10 go kind of stuff we've got yeah. a lot of that housekeeping done ahead of time and, and and a tremendous amount of it is is data management is 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 working with um huge amounts of data i mean you know yeah. all of us were the kind you know we were the kids that were sitting at the back of the math class you know, flicking pieces of paper at people not paying any attention. Lacey, I'm not so sure because Lacey's uh, a bit of a math whiz. But now we're, we're dealing with a huge amount of data and, and the previous model, because it has the real patch in, because yeah. it has the real show fire, we can go, okay, we've actually got the group of lights on this truss and the group of lights on this truss accidentally on the same address and nobody caught it. And now when we're moving the dial on the board and that light's moving and that light's moving, that's not going to be optimal. And then we don't have to send people up in boom lifts or climb the trust to change addresses and lights or yeah. even do it RDM over a remote network. Again, it's about putting the time where it makes a difference to the overall arc of the, uh, arc of the yeah. show. And you feel like you can be more creative now with having all of that stuff done beforehand. Whereas like new skin, you know, we have three days to put it in that, that right. doesn't include any time for you to actually sit down at a desk and program <laughs> right. a single queue so now right. you're walking in, what, 90%, 85% of the way there, and then it's just refinement from there? Yeah, and, and I think that, well, certainly from a pragmatic standpoint, you know, it, it still needs the design team. And, and sometimes we do it off-site. You know, we did, we did a, 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 a big project in the Middle East earlier in the, uh, in, the latter, in the latter part, rather, of 2019, where we did a lot of previs in the States before, before we went over to the UNESCO site in, in Riyadh. But like to use New Skin as an example, we, there wasn't a ton of creative work done, um, but there was a, all of the pragmatic stuff was done. So yeah. when Iggy sat down in his room with Chris Herman for the, uh, for the business theater side, and I sat down with DC, we were ready to start with the creative side of programming. And, and, and I think it's easy to 
underestimate the demand that the size of current lighting systems put on programs. And, and frankly, I consider them a lot of the time co-designers, certainly lighting directors more than programmers because yeah. they're not just button mashers. They're part of the creative process. And I think if you can have a clear point where you say, okay, we're going to do all the pragmatic and all the practical stuff up to here. And now we're going to start doing creative. You, you know how it is as well. You, you, you have this bipolar nature to what you do that there's the tactical and the creative. And if you can be all tactical, you're super efficient. And if you can be all creative, you're super efficient. But I think as beings, it's difficult for us. And I think it's mentally exhausting to keep flipping back and forth. And, and that's, and, and so I think it, it's, it's not only respectful to our programmers, directors, co-designers to have that boundary, but frankly, it's self-serving because it's more efficient. But I know when a programmer walks in on site, if we've given them the resources ahead of time to be able to do all of their homework and the time to do all their homework, and I have this discussion a lot with producers because they're like, what, pre-production for the programmer? What's that all about? And when I explain this and say, when we walk in and we're on site or when we go into the, into the suite and we start the creative part, I want it to be all about creative. I don't want it to be, all right, you're going to spend the morning doing deeply tactical patch stuff and then at lunchtime, you're magnificent. You're going to transform into a butterfly yeah. of creativity. <laughs> and, and, and for the guys to not go, oh, God, hang on a minute. I just need to get my head in order. Now, obviously, yeah. there are shows we have to do that. But if we can avoid that and give people space to deliver their best work in the way that works best for them, then that's a win for all of us. Yeah. So, what, uh, so managing that up to that process are there any other software solutions you guys use, Vectorworks, Previs, anything else you guys use heavily to add? People in, yeah, people in the lighting end of things will, will, will be very familiar with a remarkable piece of software called LightRack, which, which is designed by John McKernan, who, who is one of the loveliest people you could ever hope to meet. And, and, and frankly, one of those unsung heroes of the production industry. Um, John started Light Right really to support um, uh, Broadway, and to and 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 he's a New Yorker and 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 deeply vested in the Broadway theater market. But what it is is it's basically a relationship-based database that lets you manage the huge amounts of data that you have for for lighting fixtures, everything from creating pull lists to to go into the shop, to patch lists to um, uh, uh, patch this both the console side of, side of things and paperwork and documentation for the for the lighting crew to help them stay on top of this huge amount of data and 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 um, John has has committed several <laughs> lifetimes to yeah. to light right and and it really is one of those great situations which I love it's one of the things I love Jordan is is we're we're a business that embraces the small innovator and the small entrepreneur in yeah. ways that few others do, because there are these people that have these really amazing niches coming up with this software where other people could write light, right? But it's hard to imagine how it could be better. And everybody loves John. So yeah. it's so if I can give money to a giant faceless software conglomerate, or I can give it to my friend John McKernan. I'm going to give it to John McKernan a hundred times, and and, yeah. and 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 Lightright works seamlessly, bidirectionally with Vectorworks, so you can put information in Vectorworks, it put to your Lightright document. If you find an error in your Lightright document, and put it in and fix it in the Lightright document, it can be set up so that it can bidirectionally feed back into the Vectorworks um, uh, software and uh, and update both directionally. But that's wow. a huge kind of information uh, management tool for us. I love that. That's and certainly any, anybody that's listening that, that, that is getting into the business, um, John does great uh, uh, student access and there's a ton of, uh, of really good uh, online training for that. I think this is a great opportunity for, for those of us that have been in the business X years, shall we say 30 for round numbers. And those are people that have been in the business for 30 months to yep. be improving ourselves. And we're spending a lot of time finding resources for people. Learning light right is a great thing to do if you're getting started in the business. It will change your life. Yeah, that's awesome. So 
we manage projects, we create it, we come up with all this paperwork, we do all this stuff, and then suddenly, boom, we hop on a plane, we're flying to the gig, wherever that happens to be. What are the things that you travel with as a designer? What are the what, like the, the key things that you travel with? Yeah, I think the things that some of the things that that we do that I do as a as a designer, Jordan, um, and and it, it's it's interesting the way that um, that 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 we were sort of at light switch a bit of an early adopter of some of this is things that make people's lives more comfortable, uh, and I mean this in really small ways. Personally, I'm sitting down now, so I'm not pacing, but I'm a stand up best. So I have. Um, at Upstaging and at VO West and a few other partners that we work with, the very desk stand-up desks. Because I like to stand up, I'm more productive standing up. Um, we were early adopters of the notion of comfy chairs for those people that like to, to sit. Uh, you, you, I know it sounds ridiculous, but 25 years ago, nobody was bringing chairs on, uh, no. on site. And we had programmers that were sitting in ballroom chairs. And I'm like, this is insane. I've got somebody who gets up like a 95-year-old man because they're sitting in a ballroom chair for 16, 18 hours a day for five days on, online. Ouch. For the love of God, somebody go to Office Depot and buy some chairs. It's money <laughs> well spent. Access to tea and coffee. And you've seen our cases that, that, that we work with vendors yeah. to make sure on site. So, so myself, I, I travel relatively light. I'm a Mac guy, so it's my MacBook. It's a... Um, it, it, it's, a it's a MacBook. MacBook. It's making sure my computer's charged. It's having a couple of batteries for my phone. Um, I'm a big fan of, um, of, of something that's changed my world is this thing called Lumu, which is a little light sensor, which plugs into your iPhone, which is incredibly accurate. Um, oh. There's probably one around here somewhere. I don't see one. I'm gonna use this as a stand-in. This is the nose cone from a Sat5 model, but it's about this kind of size. Um, and <laughs> it, it. Plugs into, it plugs into your iPhone. And makes oh, wow. and turns your iPhone into a really so accurate. It just pops in right there. Pops like in right, right there. The yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, uh, and turns it into a really accurate uh, uh, luminosity and color temperature meter. And they're working on a CRI variant of it. Uh, and I've annoyingly AB'd it with my twenty five hundred dollar all singing all dancing Siconic meter. And, and it's within fractions of a percent. Um, so wow. that's great, something I, I can tuck in my pocket. Um, we try to keep our information um, as, as fluid and flexible as possible. And, and we print a lot of our paperwork out because we still do need printed documents yeah. on, this, uh, on this paper called Tetra paper, which is made from recycled water bottles, which is a laser printable paper that you can draw on with huh. um, dry erase markers, uh, and is near indestructible. You can spill your drink on it. You can put it on the floor and step on it, and you can wipe it clean. So, so those are some of the things that 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 we use to to make sure that 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 we are as individuals and as um, and as professionals equipped. And, and the other thing that I try to do uh, that I think is my obligation. I think this is again a commonality with um, with with the light switch team is come on site with a positive frame of mind, prepared to work with your colleagues in other departments. And, and frankly, having done your damn homework, um, yeah. we, we get paid a lot of money. We have a great job. L look over the show flow. Uh, you know, it, it beggars belief the number of times that I'll get into a show flow meeting with people. And it's super clear they haven't looked at any of the paperwork. Yeah, um, read the paperwork, do your homework, be prepared. Certainly, when I sit down with a program, and the last thing I want to be doing is going, uh, who's the client? What's their brand color again? It, 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 they, they, they make us stewards of their brands. We should know the brands. When you're working yes. for a band, you should know the music. When you're working for a corporate client, you should at least have looked at their Wikipedia page. You should at least have figured out what makes them tick. You should know who the CEO is. And I mean that so that when he walks in the room and, and increasingly, um, you know, when I got started, you'd be able to tell the C-suite people, uh, they would walk in with a whole bunch of handlers, you know, they'd be invariably in a suit, they would be super annoyed about being there, they would uh, come in with a whole bunch of, of admin assistants and you'd know that was the case. The guy that sits down next to you at the console in a pair of jeans and a sweatshirt and starts to chat to you about what you're doing could well be the CEO. And on yeah. several occasions with us, 
has been, um, and you know, and and certainly as what we do has morphed, um, you know, then the, a lot of them are there our age and they've grown up going to rock shows and they love the technology and and they love the gear. So learn a little about your client. Look on their website. Look at their commercials. Look at their YouTube channel. Look at their social media. See the way they speak. What's important to them because that's what they're charging us to do is amplify their voice. You yeah. know, we're back to think about telling stories. You know. The person in row triple Z at the back of the balcony, they're not getting a physical connection with the presenter on stage. That's our job. Our job is to give that connection. And the only way we can help them spread their voice through the whole room is if we understand what they're trying to say. Yeah, that's awesome. So all of that, I, that's actually a great point. A little bit of research. I mean, 10 minutes of a Google search of, you know, right. Cisco yeah. CEO Boom, exactly. photo. And, and, yeah. you and trust know. me, they have a Wikipedia page. Yeah, yeah so. exactly. Um, so what are the top three things that you need on every single show you do? Like every single one, if I don't have these three things, like it'll be hard. Are you talking, okay, so define that. Are we talking about from a from an equipment Just standpoint? Anything, or anything. Okay. It could be coffee, it could be, you know, okay. your 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 big. I'm I'm a, I'm a water head. guy, so I so I gotta have my water bottle. Um, yeah. uh, I I'm because I spend a lot of time um uh dealing with the computer and external keyboard is a, is a is a game changer for me, and yeah. and then uh, frankly um a little bit of physical space. Yeah, I'm a bigger guy. I've got shoulders, you know, and just some room. To, to set up is, is important to me. I, I personally don't like feeling cramped. So if yeah. I've, got, I've got my water, I've got an external keyboard, and I've got some elbow room, I'm, yeah. I'm a happy man. I've discovered the magic of an external keyboard. Put my laptop up on a little, you know, slightly elevated stand yeah. so I'm not yeah. looking down on it. You're feeling, you know, you can feel like you're up. You know, your back is straight. You're not feeling all hunched over, shoulder exactly. It's a good posture, yes. Yes, yes. 100%. Um, yeah, and, and then now you can use Sidecar on Macs, but for a long time I was a user of Duet to you to be able to use your iPad as an external screen. You know, we were talking Sidecar. before. Uh, Sidecar, Sidecar's baked into Catalina now that any device, I mean, you could do it with an iPhone. I don't know why you'd want to, but any um, Apple device will work as an external monitor with a Catalina-based uh, uh, MacBook. Huh. So, so certainly when you're dealing with something like Vectorworks, which has eight bazillion menus, or you're in that point where you're going from Vectorworks to Light, right, or from the lighting budget to the gear list or any of this, to have a little bit more virtual elbow room as well as physical, Duet works really well. You plug in your, um, your Apple device into your laptop with a Thunderbolt cable and you use... with. Um, and you, you open up a sidecar and your system preferences and you're off to the races. I can't imagine yeah. there isn't the same thing for Windows machines too. So that's that's super helpful as well. A, I guess that's a good reason for me to get off high Sierra. <laughs> it is a, it's a re and that and dark mode. Everybody loves dark mode. Certainly for what we do, sitting in dark rooms. You know, I remember um, uh, when I went and got my eyes tested uh, a few years ago and I was talking to to the ophthalmologist and she's like, describe a typical day. And I'm like, okay, well, um, spend a lot of time um, either if I'm in the office working on computers or if I'm on site, looking at monitors which are close and a stage which is usually brightly lit that's the other end of the room. And she's like, oh, your eyes hurt at the end of the day. Yeah, there's a medical uh, description for that. I'm like, oh, there is, she said, yeah, it's duh. Um, so, so keeping your monitor um, brightness level as low as you can I personally find a real help for me. It reduces eye strain for me, keeping the ambient light around me when I'm in a dark space as low as possible. A, I don't get up and fall over something because I can't see it, but it also helps helps uh, reduce eye strain. Awesome, love that. So what are the things that you like or what is like the one thing you like about your job, designer, lighting designer, the most? What do you like the most about what you do? Oh, hands down, Jordan, it's collaboration. It, it, it's collaboration and the more than the sum of the parts. Um, it's things like when we all get together for a tech meeting and we, we've got, um, we're trying to put a uh, 10 pounds of gear in a, in, a, in a five pound size venue, or we've got challenges like we had on New Skin where there were some pragmatic issues that we had to deal with 
both from a planning standpoint and then execution wise on site because of uh, some unforeseen course corrections when you get that sense that everybody is pulling together and everybody is focused on finding a solution and there is no such thing as a bad place for a good idea and everybody's thoughts are welcome you know it um it, it amazes me that people are taken aback when they're not from my department and they come up to me and tell me something that I should know, that I would react in any way other than, oh, holy shit, thanks, man. You know, like, hey, I was just up in the balcony and that light was in my eyes. Or the fixture that you've got that you can't see is pointing in the wrong direction. Or I think you're going to set that piece of scenery on fire with that Sharpie. Um, or, hey, I was just watching this and did you think about trying this? Because a lot of time I'm going to go, I had no idea, or no, that's a great idea, or sure, let's try it, because who knows? So everybody feeling that their um, that their that their creative work working with Carmen is a great example of, of this, um, um, because I, I Carmen and several of the other audio designers that I mentioned too, I can go to them and say, look, there's certainly with music stuff, there's a cue in here that is motivating something that's happening visually, and I can't hear it. And if I can't hear it, the lights are going to do this and the audience is going to go, well, that was weird. Why did that just happen? Can you give that a little gas? And they'll go, right, oh, sure, sure, of course. Um, that collaborative team-based thing, when you come to me and say, hey, have you thought about trying this? And it's like, oh, that's an awesome idea, Jordan. Or if, you rig, if we rig it this way, I can give you those lighting positions and we can save the production some money. Uh, all of that stuff. That, I'm a collaborator at, at, at heart. That's why I founded 27 years ago a design company, not just being a solo designer, because I'd love to collaborate. I, I, th I find awesome. that, that that collaborative energy a really powerful fuel. I love that. What about the least? What's the what's your least favorite thing about what you do? And you can't say nothing. Right now, right now, <laughs> right now. <laughs> not doing gigs. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah. I had I didn't have a least favorite. What's my least favorite? Um, my least favorite is being really clear on what the goals are for a project and missing. Um, I, I, we, we have always tried at light switch, and this is going to sound like a strange expression, Jordan, but we've always made it a, tried to make it a safe place to fail because from a creative standpoint, people will always do their best work. If they feel that there is room for them to fail in a safe place where people will pick them up. So we spend a lot of time talking about our failures because there's a lot to learn from there. That, that, that what our clients challenge us to do is be at 100%. And, and that means that we have to do that. And, and safety is at 85%. And in, in any realm of creativity, um, all the interesting stuff happens around the edges, whether it's music or dance or art or drama or writing or anything. All of the interesting stuff is the outliers. The outliers have to be prepared to fail. So we have to be prepared to fail. So when a client comes to us and says, um, the thing you're pitching, have you done that before? And we go, no. Is it going to work? Well, we certainly hope so. But, but sometimes it doesn't. And, and you and I have shared some of those experiences. And, that, yeah. and regardless of whether it's apparent to the audience or not, there, and there are a few clients of ours that really embrace that same, um, that same gestalt. A lot of our tech clients because they're on the cutting edge of what they're doing from a technology standpoint, there's, there's a certain networking client that, 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 that we have who is always prepared to push and try new things because otherwise you just end up with a bunch of pipe and drape in a room lit mostly in blue and somebody on stage giving a variant of the speech last year. That to move the needle for experiences, um, you, need, you need a producer that is prepared to embrace that and go to the client and say, we're going to try something bold. Sometimes that doesn't work. That's my least favorite thing where you go, damn it. I was so sure that was going to be amazing. I was so sure that was going to work and, and it didn't. And, and the smart thing to do, even though it's hard, are those times is to go, okay, dust myself off, put on my big boy pants, go find the client, say sorry, it was a swing and a miss, um, and learn from why it didn't work and refocus and regroup and reframe. That's... I love that. And th that actually, everything you just said may answer 
this next question, which is if somebody wants to become a designer, they see, you know, they're just coming into the lighting field or they see what they, they see this huge stage show, rock show, something like I want to design that or something like that. What should they be doing now to be able to eventually get there to set themselves up for that success eventually? Um, I, I think the best way to answer that is, is probably to talk about what we look for in people we hire that come into our company. And that's, uh, I, I think, work on getting really clear about what your particular style is. Um, and do that in any way that you're comfortable with. Rip and pull from magazines, do your own Pinterest page. Um, start a blog, whatever methodology works for you, but get really clear and be able to tell people what what your aesthetic is. The most interesting resumes that we get are the ones that have not page and page and page of line item stuff, but are interesting, ideally amusing and entertaining. But also we get a really strong sense about what makes that person tick. We want to understand what people's own particular uh, gestalt is and what their creativity is. And, and I think um, I, I think it was Miles Davis that said that you can't play like anybody until you can play like yourself. And I think mm. that's really important for people in the creative field. Not everybody works with everybody else because, because what we do is ultimately subjective. Um, yep. and, and I work with the clients I work with because they like what I do in my style. My colleagues work with clients because they like their style. And, and so having a different, defined sense of what is your style, I think also helps you have a base so you can go, all right, my style's here, my client style's here, I know where those two are, so now I can map out the path between them. Um, so you're a musician as well. I'm sure you have a style that you play, that you like to play, that you've spent a long time working on and finessing. I, I think it's the same with any creative venture get really comfortable with your own style, and then you can improvise from there. Once you've got a base, once you've got a fundamental knowledge of what your own ethos and aesthetic is, you can riff on that as much as you like. That's awesome. I love that. So last question. Two okay. things that somebody can do. They just finished a gig today. All right, it was a good gig, but they want to be better tomorrow. What are two things that they could be thinking about to be better tomorrow so that their next gig is better than their last one? I, I would say be your own worst pragmatic critic. And what I mean by that is not just go, oh, it sucks. That's all F and I'm crap at this and I'm never gonna get anywhere. Look at it to celebrate both your, your challenges and your victories and write them down. Start to log them, get really clear. What worked well and what didn't work well in a way that there's this notion of, of, of conscious practice that, that most professional musicians get good because they do conscious practice. They're really good at understanding what they, what they need to work on, but they're also really good at understanding what they do well. So they don't spend time relearning the stuff that they already know. So yeah. get really clear about what worked and what didn't and why, and then document it. It's, it, it, it. it sounds basic, but we talk to people all the time and we ask them about shows and they've got like six blurry iPhone photos. If, if your hands are full, get somebody else to take photos. You don't necessarily need to put them on a website or post them on Facebook or whatever, but especially when you're starting in your career, I, I wish I had much better documentation of the early part of my career because, because certainly what I do hiring creatives is I want to see what the arc looks like. And if I've only got this bit of the arc, not this bit, I can't extrapolate where that person is going and their through line. And I think that's the same for us from self-analysis. Is, is get really clear about what worked, what didn't, and document it. That's awesome. Because I do the same thing. I'll document something, and then I'll have an idea two years later. And I'm like, oh, I remember that one thing that, that you know, John right. Featherstone did on that show. I'd love <laughs> to do something just like that on this my, one. My, yeah, my friend, uh, what's, what's the quote? I think it's attributed to, to Picasso that intelligence borrows, but genius steals. So. <laughs> That's right. Awesome. Well, hey, John, thank you so much for taking your time today. I know it's precious. We appreciate it. Uh, it's and, my, it's uh, my pleasure. Anytime hope, I'm talking to you, it's all good. Well, I appreciate it. And hopefully we can uh, do some more conversations down the road talking about other exciting things and where the industry's going coming out of uh, this very challenging time. I will greatly enjoy that. And good luck to everybody that's listening. This too shall pass, I promise. 
Yes, it will. We're looking forward to what's on the other side. I can tell you that. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited and so humbled that you would choose to take just a little bit of your time to join us on this podcast and listen in on some of the great conversations that we're having. I hope that your next gig is better than your last because ultimately that is all that matters to me. I want to make sure that you are able to do better events, better shows, better tours than you did yesterday, all because you gained valuable information and valuable knowledge from what we discussed here today. You know, I think that every single day we are looking to get better and that is exactly where I want us to be. Now, the value that we bring to you is directly tied to each and every one of you. We could sit here and talk all day long about all the stuff we do, all the great events and everything like that, but if we're not giving you the value that you want, there's no way that this is gonna be good for you. And ultimately, who cares who I talk to if you're not getting value? So please let me know, gigready at gigrent.com. You can reach out to me. I'll make sure to read every single email because I know that it's valuable to you to be heard and I want you to share your ideas, your thoughts. Who do you wanna have on the podcast? Who do you want to share? What are things you wanna learn? What are things you wanna grow in so that we can get better at creating live events? People connect in person. And each and every one of us facilitates that process in our own small way. I'm excited for what the future holds. I'm excited for where we're going. I know that there are great things ahead of us and they're not just behind us. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.